to everybody for making it on this Saturday evening and we are quite happy and thrilled to have you all here. There are lot many controversial bills that this government has introduced. One among them is the right to information uh, bill or the amendment bill of 2019. And we thought that we should have an elaborate discussion on the bill and also make it possible that how do we look at as the citizens of this country. So uh, we are quite privileged to have Rakesh Reddy Dubudu, who has always been a wonderful friend of Ramakar and he has never turned out any kind of you know, request whenever we have reached out to him. And thankfully even today, with, uh, despite his lots of engagements, he has been able to make it. So uh, without further ado, I am just going to invite him to take over and uh, you know, do his uh, presentation and followed by a Q&A session and of course you can also indulge in the discussion. Rakesh Reddy, to do for you, the factory owner and also the champion of RPI in Hyderabad. Thank you, Rakesh. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, briefly I'll, I'll just touch upon it because without such understanding, uh, you won't be able to understand what the amendment is all about. So as you know, the right to information is a central legislation which was enacted in 2005 when the UPA government took over for the first time. So in fact, it was one of their uh, manifesto promises back then. So they came to power and subsequently uh, enacted this legislation. So since 2005, it's, you know, we are in the 14th year of implementation and this has been hailed as one of the most progressive legislations this country has seen ever since independence. Uh, the simple reason being, it has empowered you, me, every common citizen without uh, quote unquote any connections to authorities' power to hold governments to account, get information from the government which was hitherto not accessible. So just to give you a brief idea of how the RTA system works, so usually anybody who uh, wants to ask for certain information from the government files an, files an application with the relevant government department. This is called the application level. So if you don't get information or you're not convinced with the, the kind of information supplied to you, then there's something known as appeal, first appeal. That also happens within the department, within the government structure. If you still are not, uh, not satisfied, let's say uh, the first appeal also does not give you, uh, you feel uh, there's not enough justice, then you go and approach an institution called the Information Commission. So within the structure of right to information, every state has one Information Commission. So in Hyderabad, for example, Telangana has an information commission very close to, uh, in the old ACB headquarters, very close to the Mojang Dai market. Uh, similarly, Andhra has its own commission and every state has its own commission. And at the central level, we have one central information commission, which is in Delhi. So the, they don't actually share a relationship like the High Court and Supreme Court. So unlike High Court and Supreme Court, they're quite independent. So the state information commission is not bound by the central information commission. Both are independent. Now, what do they do? So the State Information Commission, their jurisdiction extends to all state government departments. The Central Information Commission, their, their jurisdiction extends to all central government departments. So there is no overlap in their work. So that is the first thing. They're independent. Uh, nobody has any authority over the other. Right. So this is briefly. So in the when the law was first enacted in 2005, so the information commissions were always uh, meant to be a very, very important institution for the better implementation of the law. Because at the end of the day, they were the final adjudicating authority. If some applicant is not satisfied with the kind of information provided, the only recourse he has is to go to the commission. The commissions were meant to be independent as per the original law. So they are selected by a three-member committee. At the central level, the three-member committee consists of the prime minister, a senior cabinet minister nominated by the prime minister, and also the leader of the opposition in the, in the Lok Sabha. At the state level, uh, a similar committee sits, the chief minister, a senior cabinet minister nominated by the chief minister as well as the leader of the opposition in the state legislative assembly. So this is the selection and it was also proposed in the original act which also subsequently was true that uh, these information commissioners were made equivalent in terms of salary and rank to certain existing officials so that their independence was, uh, was maintained. So for instance the chief information commissioner of the central information commission was made equivalent to the chief election commissioner of India. So as you know, we, we just concluded a, a mammoth general election to the Lok Sabha. You know how powerful the election commission is during the election season. Because they become the whole and soul. They have all the independence. So the whole idea of equating them to a chief election commissioner or an election commissioner was to give them that independence. That they are not bound by any government rules. So quote unquote, if tomorrow the topmost bureaucrat in the state, his office is also not providing information, he may also be summoned. They should have that power. So that was the original idea. That's the context. Now what has happened now? So it is no more a bill. In fact, the discussion should have been act because it is now notified and 
This is an act now. No more a bill. It's passed by both houses of parliament. The president signed it. Now, just I'll, I'll go back in time because the context is necessary. Uh, this is not the first assault on right to information. Uh, this is not, BJP government is not the only government which has done this. There are at least uh, three recorded attempts of changing the law uh, since 2005. This is the fourth attempt. They were successful the fourth time. So in 2005, when the act, in fact, the act was passed in 2005, as you know, 2006, the, Cong the then Congress government tried changing the law for the first time. Again, they were not successful because there were widespread protests, civil society opposed it. So what was the amendment mooted then? The amendment mooted then was that, uh, I don't know if you're, how many of you are uh, comfortable with government jargon. So within the government files, there's something known as file noting. So file noting is nothing but the heart of all files within the government, where bureaucrats, officials who get that file record their opinions. Because that carries a lot of weight and eventually that uh, decides make or break in terms of decision making. So the government of the day uh, back then was trying to hide these file notings. They were uh, trying to uh, amend the law to exclude them. But again, like I said, uh, it was just in 2006. So civil society came together and they went back. The second attempt was done in 2013 uh, when, again, the penultimate year of UPA2, when if you, I don't know how many of you remember, but this famous, the Central Information Commission judgment, where they held that political parties are also public authorities they should also come under the right to information. So that was the second attempt. If you, I don't know if you remember, but there was a huge uh, uh, uproar and all the political parties came together saying, you know, how can we come under RTA? So 2013, the UPA, the then UPA2 government tried excluding political parties from RTA. Again, they didn't go ahead because again, there were widespread protests. There is a second attempt. The third attempt was done in 2018, uh, just before the elections. The same amendment like we have now, but uh, for some strategic reason, they felt they didn't have enough numbers, so they went back. They, they introduced it in the Rajya Sabha, but they didn't take it up for discussion. The same bill, which was not discussed in 2018, was brought back uh, immediately after they came to power uh, recently, and uh, it was initially introduced in the Lok Sabha, then subsequently you all know the history and the Rajya Sabha passed it. So I'll briefly look at what are these amendments and uh, what are the reasons that the government is saying, the reasons for these amendments and why some of them don't add up and what could be the potential impact. So to start with, this amendment act makes three changes to the law, essentially three sections. It amends section 13, section 16, and section 27. Now what does it do? It simply says in section 13, what it says is, earlier, like I told you, the, the, ten, uh, the salary, tenure, everything was in the act. So the tenure of any information commissioner who was appointed, either will be five years, or till he or she attains an age of 65, which was earlier. Now what they have done is tenure, salary and all the allowances will now, after the amendment, will be decided by the central government. So in a way, they have usurped the authority of deciding uh, what should their salary be, what should their tenure be, that the central government of the day will decide. So something that was already there in the act, which was sacrosanct in terms of five years, in terms of they being made equal to the chief election commissioner, will no more be true. Now, who will they be equal to tomorrow? We never know because the government of the day will have to frame rules. Those rules are not yet framed. We never know what will happen tomorrow. So that is the first amendment. Section 16 is talks about the State Information Commission. So they have made the same change there also. That you know, the central government of the day will decide the tenure, the salary and allowances of the State Information Commissioners also. Section 27 amendment is nothing but a very technical amendment that uh, it gives the power to the central government to make such rules. Now, what are the what are the reasons uh, the central government? So, the central government spoke in multiple voices before this amendment. Uh, if you remember, the one who was championing this amendment uh, in the parliament was Mr. Jitendra Singh, who is a minister in the, of the Department of Personnel and Training, also in the Prime Minister's office. Uh, is an MP from uh, Jammu and Kashmir, BJP MP from Jammu and Kashmir. So, he was championing this. So, he, in the public domain as well as on the floor of the house, he mentioned two to three different reasons for changing this law, or rather bringing this amendment. The first reason being, in fact, he made a lot of statements which were factually wrong and unfortunately on the floor of the house, uh, they could speak uh, lies. Uh, it's a fact of the day. So they, we've also written, I'll tell you what all they spoke. So he made multiple statements. I'll go one after the other. The first statement that he made, in fact, it is also there in the objects and reasons. So every law will have a statement of objects and reasons which specify the reasons uh, for which they're amending the act. The reason they say, the first reason is, they say a chief election commissioner in India is equivalent to a Supreme Court judge in terms of their salary and perks. 
So, in effect, since the Chief Information Commissioner is made equivalent to the Chief Election Commissioner, so he also becomes equal to the Supreme Court judge. Now, they say it is an anomaly. And how is this an anomaly? They say, so if he is equal to the Supreme Court judge, but somebody tomorrow, if they are not satisfied with the decision of the Information Commissioner, can actually make a, can file a writ petition either in the High Court or a Supreme Court. So, how can somebody's order, who is equivalent to a Supreme Court judge, can be challenged again in the High Court or Supreme Court. They said, this is the reason we want to change it. It's an anomaly. That is reason number one. Reason number two, they wanted to, they say they wanted to rationalize all the independent tribunals. The National Human Rights Commission, there are multiple other tribunals. They wanted to rationalize because each one's appointment terms were different, etc. That is the second reason. And uh, on the floor of the House, on the floor of the, the both the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha, uh, the government of the day said, you know, we have, we have done a lot for RTI. Uh, so, in fact, this amendment will strengthen and not weaken. So, whether it will weaken or strengthen, we'll talk about it. Uh, so, he made few other statements through the course of this bill, uh, introducing this bill. One statement is that they went beyond what was there in the Act, because as you know, both uh, in the 16th Lok Sabha as well as this Lok Sabha, there is no officially recognized leader of the opposition, because nobody was able to get those mandatory 10% seats. So, Congress got 44 last time, 52 this time. They said, we went one step ahead and even accommodated Mallikarjun Karge, who was uh, the leader of the Congress in the previous Lok Sabha, in the appointment committee, though Congress was not legally treated as the opposition. So, we went one step ahead, we were magnanimous. That was the statement he made. Now, this statement is absolutely false and uh, falls flat on its face. The reason being, in the Act, when the Act was uh, passed in 2005, this was envisaged. A, a situation would come where no party would have the opposition status. So, in the Act, it was clearly written, when no opposition leader is recognized, the leader of the single largest opposition party in the Lok Sabha will de facto become the member of the committee. It was there in the Act. BJP government has not done anything new. So, they said it's, a, it's their achievement, though it was already there in the law. The second thing they said is, during the Congress government, that means before 2014, the right to information was a 10 to 5 Act, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Act. But where after we took over, it became a 24 by 7 act. The, uh, these are, th this is his statement, verbatim. Now, what did he mean by that? He said, we, uh, before we took over, you know, people could file only when the officers were working. But when we took over, we made everything online. So, it becomes 24 7. Now, this statement is also factually wrong because the right to information online portal, which allows people to file applications online to the central government departments, was launched in 2013. Again, in the penultimate year of the UPA2. So, when this falls flat on their face, of course, uh, there is no denying that the BJP government did not take it down. In fact, they expanded. They added a lot more departments. To their credit, they did that. But to say that we have launched it is blatantly false and on the, the floor of the house, they did this. The third thing they said is, it's a historic wrong in the sense, they said in 2005, this act was passed in haste without much discussion. So, we are trying to correct something that was blatantly wrong in the first place. Now, let's go back in time again. So, was it passed in haste? You know, we will the record. The records are pretty clear. So, in December 2004, this act was introduced in the Lok Sabha. Uh, the, uh, this bill was introduced in the Lok Sabha in 2004, December, when the UPA took over. It was actually sent to a standing committee uh, for a detailed debate and discussion. The standing committee took around three months to deliberate and submit its report. So, it was only passed, uh, if you know history, in May 2005. The act was passed subsequently in May 2005. And June, uh, it was signed by the President and October 12th, it started, uh, I mean, the act came into force on October 12th. So, to say that it was passed in haste is again blatantly wrong because it was actually sent to a standing committee. There were uh, wide-ranging deliberations. And secondly, uh, and uh, it's ironic, the current president of India was also a member of that standing committee then. He was a member of the Raj Sabha then, Mr. Uh, Sri Ramnath Kovind. So, he was the one, he was part of that committee which unanimously said that information commission should have the level of an election commissioner. He was a member of that committee. Now, because he is now the president of India, he signed it without discussion. So, when he was a member of the standing committee and a member of the Rajya Sabha, he had a different opinion. Now, he has a different opinion. So, that's a historical context. So, uh, whatever they said on the floor of the, there were many factual errors. So, they, right. Now, so, let's come back to, so, there were a lot, other, um, lot, lot more amendments that were proposed by private members, not of course by the government. So, some, uh, some belonging to the BJP, some belonging to the others for the last 14-15 years. So, some of them went to the extent of saying that anybody who is asking for information should specify reasons. 
there was one bjp member not bjp shivsena mp who proposed this in 2007 of course uh, those didn't go through that is a different matter but there have been such attempts as well now let's come back to the current time now does this amendment change anything you know let us look at, look at objectively it only changes the tenure uh, the the tenure the salaries allowances of the information commissions which eventually the central government will decide so one the central government will indirectly control the tenure salaries and allowances of the state commissions also earlier that was not the case because uh, it was there in the act so in a way it is does it disturb federalism in a sense yes because they usurp the power of the states the second thing is objectively saying does it actually change anything for us as information seekers i mean forget about who is appointed as a commissioner does it change anything for us technically speaking it doesn't change anything because uh, their appointment is still done by a three member committee you know that still stays the only thing that changes is their salary their allowances etc will be decided by the central government now while there is no direct impact there is a lot of indirect impact now what is the indirect impact uh, the last experience of the last 14 years shows us that very few commissioners have actually worked according to the spirit of that many of the commissioners uh, if you look at statistics many commissioners in the information commissioners were either retired bureaucrats or political appointees very few of them actually were neut so called neutral appointees who are not connected to either the government or uh, the politics now in such a scenario expecting people who will now be appointed by the government uh, to be impartial to do their duty properly of course somebody who wants to do, do their duty properly doesn't matter who appoints them what is the tenure if it's one year but practically speaking uh, you would always have that problem today so tomorrow if somebody is appointed by the government for 2 years or 3 years whatever be their tenure so since they are quote and quote not direct but indirect control of the government so how will they behave is one big challenge so will will it affect the independence of the commission technically speaking it shouldn't because nothing else is changing their powers are not changing but in terms of their appointments since this has changed will it impact the independence that is the first thing secondly if you if some of you have experience on uh, in going to the commissions and talking to these commissioners a lot of times the respect for the law is actually equivalent to the position enjoyed by these commissioners so if you talk to bureaucrats or officials who are in charge of implementation at the grassroots level uh, their working is proportional to how scared they are of the commission so if there is a good commissioner who is giving you good orders who is penalizing it would automatically have a ripple effect uh, you know to the ground where okay so this particular commissioner is very strict so if you don't give information he is going to take you to task so that kind of respect is still there so if tomorrow they suddenly feel that raise you know the status of these guys is come down is you know no more equal to a chief secretary or whatever is just like you know any other commissioner i need not be scared if that kind of uh, message goes to the grassroots of uh, to the grassroots level then we don't know how it will impact the implementation so that is point number 2 now for me if you if you ask my personal opinion uh, i am not too worried about this amendment per se but i am worried about the debate that that happened during this amendment bill was passed in the both the houses i'm more worried about uh, the direction of the debate rather than the amendment itself why why do you say so one is i'm partly happy that a debate actually took place uh, in fact a very healthy debate took place but the my un, my unease comes from the fact that at least five members to my memory at least five members belong to the ruling coalition both bjp and their alliance spoke beyond what is there in the amendment so almost all of them spoke about quote and quote misuse of the legislation so if you go and check parliament records you will see that uh, jagadambika paul uh, if i remember right then nishikant dubey then one shiv sena i think the first time mp from shiv sena and uh, uh, vinay sasrabuddhe yeah these three and one more all of them categorically on the floor of the house these are there in the parliament records said the rt act is being misused by people who have uh hijack this act people are asking for hundreds of pages of information there is a need to curb the misuse these were the statements used now why am i worried about this because no no in the in the last 14 years not once there is not a single instance where such a debate actually took place in the parliament where things went on record nobody had the gumption to actually talk about misuse now you might come back and ask me is there no misuse why are we actually you know um, uh, turning our eyes blind to it is there no misuse now i i don't call it misuse per se you can't control how people use a legislation and this is not the only legislation in the country that is misused every legislation has a share of goods and bads so it depends on people how they use it 
So per se, I, I wouldn't call it misuse, but there are people who might be using it to their financial benefit. I don't deny that. But to, but to target only this legislation, while there are hundreds of other legislations which are quote-unquote used, misused by people, I believe there is a concerted effort. It may not happen today, but down the line, they might tinker with the act. They might make more changes. That is my fear. My fear is not about this amendment. This amendment is highly technical. It, if you ask me, it doesn't impact one bit. But the debate that took place on the floor of the house, because it has opened floodgates now. So everybody would say, you know, MPs are now talking about, so uh, I do a lot of training programs for government officials also. So in almost every uh, training session, half the time would, would go into their listening to their sober stories. Everybody would talk about misuse and things like that. Now, imagine the kind of Philip they'll get when you see MPs talking about misuse on the floor of the house, because the highest lawmaking body. Now, my fear is that. My fear is not about this amendment. Uh, is there anything else to speak? Yeah, so for me, the debate is far more dangerous. The debate that ensured in the House, uh, where people spoke about misuse of the act, where people spoke about uh, uh, the time has come to control such elements. Now, what do they mean by that? We don't know, because nothing has been spoken. But at least there is now an intent. MPs have spoken about, we have to do something about it. Now, what that something, will it happen next year, next year, five years later, ten years later, I do not know. But once an amendment is made to any legislation, I think it will open floodgates. Uh, because, you know, governments, once they make one amendment, they, they won't even think twice in making another amendment. It's as easy as that. Yeah, I'll stop here. Because this is briefly. So if you have any questions, I think we'll take a discussion rather than. And, uh, yeah, one other thing that I wanted to say is a lot of people ask me, what is BJP's intention behind this? I mean, why have they done this? Now, I'm still perplexed. I don't have an answer, frankly speaking, because uh, this doesn't give them any political mileage. Uh, even common sense tells you that uh, it is not deemed as any progressive legislation. So even those who are uh, uh, supporters of that party will, will not even support it. They might not oppose it, but they'll stay silent. But uh, I'm still perplexed, you know, why the BJP went to the extent of spending so much political capital. When I say political capital, in fact, on the day when it was discussed in the Rajya Sabha, uh, till about 2 p.m. in the afternoon, most of us who, you know, who, who were, uh, uh, I wouldn't want to use the word lobbying, but uh, it was unofficial lobbying with MPs of all parties. They were, they were assuring us that they would oppose the bill. But suddenly after 2 p.m., three regional parties, BJD, TRS and YSRCP supported the amendment. So till 2 p.m., we were all confident that it will be defeated in the Rajya Sabha. But suddenly at 6 p.m., you see it was passed. So, uh, you know, it seems the Prime Minister personally called up the Chief Ministers of these states to seek support. I don't know, you know, why did they spend so much political capital on a technical amendment like this? Because it doesn't give them any political capital. It's common sense. I mean, nobody votes based on what amendment they made to the RTA and that too, not even a progressive legislation. So I'm still perplexed why they did this and, you know, what are they trying to achieve through this? But I think for me, it is what will happen tomorrow that is a greater danger than what happened today. Uh, could you explain about RTI in Kashmir uh, post? Uh, yeah, yeah. So there is the, there is, okay. The, Anyway, uh, so I, I didn't know that I'll burst fake news. Anyway, so there is this uh, uh, this one viral message which after the abrogation of 370, which went viral. I think there were 13 claims in that uh, particular post. What will change post 370? So one of the things was uh, right to information was not applicable before. Now it will be applicable. Most of you must have seen it. Uh, as you know, Article 370 gave special status to Jammu and Kashmir as a state before the parliament changed it. So they had their own constitution. The right to information as central legislation of 2005, yes, it excludes Jammu and Kashmir as a state. Uh, it did not apply to Jammu and Kashmir. But in the year 2009, Jammu and Kashmir state government passed their own version of the right to information act. So they had their own state RTI so from the year 2009. And all central government offices within the boundaries of Jammu and Kashmir were anyway subject to the central legislation. So it is false to say RTI was not applicable in the state. It is misleading. Yes, RTI was applicable, but there were limitations and restrictions. So the state had their own version of state legislation. So it was enacted in 2009 and it more or less similar to the central legislation. Now, uh, what is the situation? now because it's no more special status, no more special constitution, uh, the central legislation would apply. Uh, in line of uh, trying to, hi, and so um, in line of trying to control the misuse of this act. Hmm and putting this in contrast with the UAPA bill. Could you highlight? Uh, see, I don't know which direction it will go uh, because 
control is only spoken in the parliament so there is no law that uh, uh, that kind of uh, stops misuse today it was only spoken about there is no change made in the law uh, what what it might do which is why i said what it might do is uh, give strength to that discourse of misuse so earlier the discourse of misuse were lim limited to closed rooms and where only officials met and spoke about misuse misuse has uh, act has to be changed act has to be changed so there was no strength to them you know it was just four or five people in the closed room who were talking about it what will happen now is the discourse will become mainstream you see you know five mps have spoken about it there is misuse i am not talking about it but you see that mp has spoken about it. uh what i think will happen that will mainstream and with uopa we don't know how far will the government go to muzzle dissent so to speak but i don't know taking parallels may not be appropriate between these two because they are completely different yes it will it will still come back to the interpretation of how authorities will deem uh, what is anti state uh, but i don't know uh, frankly speaking i don't know which is right now are being put under house no no that which is what i'm saying so yeah, yeah i i i do understand that but i'm saying uh, linking it to rti today no no they've been given so no in, uh, this is a very in fact the, it's an irony that the shiv sena mp who spoke about misuse also spoke about death of activists so this young mp from shiv sena i don't remember his name he also spoke about such a contrast on one side he said there is a lot of misuse we have to control them and the other said there are deaths of activists so the visible blower protection bill which was actually passed by the previous government it's still not notified by this government for whatever reason they say what they want to change it so the answer to your question is there is already a legislation that is passed by the parliament the visible blower protection bill which is supposed to protect all visible blowers including rti activists but it has not been notified by the government yet they have been killed i mean uh, there have been more than 80 deaths multitude of threats all that has been there i don't deny so i'm saying the solution to that will not uh, it has to come through legislation again there is a visible blower protection act that was passed by the parliament but hasn't been notified by the current government for reasons best known to them if i don't get the justice in the commission state commission uh, what is the next level to yeah you can file a writ in there in the high court or the supreme court you have to file a writ petition next high court and next high court, court or supreme court yeah thank you the decision of the commission is binding uh, so you, you don't have any further appeal after the commission so if you're not satisfied with the commission's decision you have to go to the high court or the supreme court lower courts are barred from taking any there are many applications pending in the commission yes. present also yes and uh, most of the commissions are uh, commissioner are not there yes appointed. yes many commissions are waiting yes 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 and uh, and now after this act uh, means even more appointments if, even if they make more appointment of the commissioners those commissioners will be reporting directly to the central government means their tenure and the uh, everything will be decided by the central government hmm. Hmm. So even though in this present scenario, when Act was there, uh, the old Act, there was uh, people were not getting the information as they want, and there were many cases where uh, they have filed the case. It means uh, it, it has been challenged by the uh, government departments in the High Court, and uh, High Court uh, the cases are there hmm. uh, running in running condition. Yes. So uh, I think even after doing this Act, like you were saying that there is, uh, um, it, it's only a technical change. and it don't affect much to the people but when so many applications are pending and whether they, the information will be used or misused is another thing so many applications are pending and now these will further increase the applications because most of the cases the information commissioners who are in the hands of the government will not uh, allow that information to flow and okay no in see which is why i said yes it's a technical amendment but the impact of that amendment we are still not sure somebody who wants to really work doesn't matter you know if he's appointed for 6 months or 1 year they'll do it but somebody who doesn't want to you know irrespective of whatever powers you have they won't now the sanction strength is 10 plus 1 for any commission uh, there are a lot of vacancies in fact there is a pending case in the supreme court which the supreme court is hearing this uh, pe- uh, lack of commissioners in not just the central information commission but across states there is that ongoing uh, case there see it all depends on what kind of rules they make so if they make a rule saying uh, commissioners will ha- will only have a tenure of 2 years hypothetically i'm just you know uh, then you might have people behaving differently so if you say it is 5 years we don't know i mean it all depends on what kind of uh, tenure will they give what kind of salaries will be given what kind of position i mean in terms of equivalence etc 
yes with the amendment what might happen is the appointment of people from the bureaucracy and politics might increase uh, you know earlier also it was there it is no different now but this time it could be more blatant you know more and more people from political background from bureaucratic background might come into the commission which in a way will defeat in fact uh, there have been cases where people who worked in the ib and ra were made information commissioners all their life they were protecting information you know for 50 long years so 40 long years and suddenly one day you make them information commissioner and say please open up information it's an irony of sorts but this is a fact in the ca in the cic today we have people who worked in the ib and ra for all their life of you know their career of 35 years uh, I don't know. It will still depend on the individuals. So there have been some outstanding individuals who, despite uh, limitations, they have done wonderful work in the commission. Uh, no disputing. But they are a, they are a very you know a minor percentage. You know you can hardly count them on their fingers. So most of them who obviously come from the bureaucratic background, barring a few, most of them all their life were pro trying to protect state secrets. And suddenly you ask them to you know open up. Obviously you know uh, they won't do justice to the law. We have to wait and watch. Uh, I think the only way we can fight this is uh, is being vigilant. So despite all the vigilance, despite all the protests, the government went ahead, bulldozed and got it passed. You know, we couldn't do anything. I mean, there were protests, etc. But the time was very limited and, you know, they got it, done it. Now, what can we do? Nothing we can do now. We have to wait for the rules to come out if, they f if, if ever they frame rules very soon. And uh, I'm sure there's somebody, it will be challenged in the court. But at the, at the same time, we have to be vigilant. I mean, if one other side effect, unintended side effect of this whole thing could be, in fact, uh, the day after this was passed in the Rajya Sabha, we started receiving messages saying, from tomorrow, can I file applications? Is my act, is my right taken away? So the perception that has gone onto the ground is that somehow your right has been taken away now. So from tomorrow, you can no more ask for information. You can no more... So this is the perception. The problem will be this. Directly, technically, there is no impact. But the indirect impact of this, we have to bear a huge cost, like you said. You know, if people start believing in the defeatist attitude, saying, you know, my right has been taken away. Earlier, anyway, I was not getting justice. With the amendment now, we'll, you know, whatever little hope I had. So obviously, people will stop filing. It might become another the consumer rights story of 1986. So in, in 1986, when the Consumer Rights Act was passed, everybody hailed it as the next revolution. So we, we now see the state of consumer rights. Of course, there is a new law that they are contemplating. But so if we don't want RTI to die, go that way, we have to be vigilant. In fact, uh, there, is, there is a campaign at the national level to actually file RTI to save RTI. File more RTIs now. Demand more information from the government. We want to tell people that we are not, we are not cowed down. Just because you say there is misuse, we don't stop. You know, this is our information, this is our government. We have every right to ask for information. So there is, there is a concerted effort at the national level to actually increase the number of applications. To tell governments that, you know, we are not worried about your misuse or whatever kind of discourse that you make, but we are committed to actually asking more information from the government. Sir, I am from different background. I just wanted to know, uh, what is the procedure of filing this RTI? Very simple way. Which one? See, it depends on which office and where. So if it's a central government office, you can do it online. So if it's a state government office, you might have to do it physically. We can, we can speak after this session. Uh, my question is related to the old uh, act. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes the government departments like RBI or the uh, uh, central home, home, home department deny certain information from providing like, uh, I mean, same reasons like national security, country's prestige. Hmm. Don't you think as a citizens of this country, we are, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, are we supposed to know everything about our country? <coughs> the examples are like RBI units, uh, NTA details and uh, Larva Du Shastri death details and uh, recent rapid details. See, of course, the see, is there is there is a case for governments to hold certain secrets for strategic reasons, but those are adequately covered in the Act. So, if you look at Section 8, which defines exemptions in the Act, there are 10 provisions. There are enough. But the way they have been interpreted and used by departments, like you said, has been, especially in the case of RBI. RBI has been one prime. Uh, uh, culprit in all this start not just with NPS forget NPS starting with NPS to you know the list of uh, Default. uh, defaulters list they've been uh, very very adamant to share this information forget about even demonetization the board minutes the board meeting minutes of RBA they were reluctant to share at least till last year so now they have put it in the public domain I mean the 
the meeting that happened where they decided the demonetization, they gave sanction to demonetization. So RBI has been one pile culprit, one couple of cases are in the Supreme Court now, especially with respect to defaulters. Uh, see, there is, there is nothing like 100 zero. Obviously, you know, there is a case for state to hold some secrets, but the problem with that is uh, bureaucrats have their own way of interpreting, you know, what is a secret. So there is one extreme which says everything should be a secret, there is another extreme, everything should be open. So it's a dicey thing, but uh, I mean, they end up in court. So courts, uh, either the High Court or Supreme Court will then say, okay, th should this be a state secret? Should be, should it be open? At least RBI, I think, after you know, couple of uh, other court judgments, they have just started opening up a lot of other information. Not just RBI, but most other departments, where uh, because of court judgments or because people have incessantly asked for information, more and more information, at least, is coming to the public domain. I think the same thing will happen in these cases also. So you said uh, I can go to High Court or Supreme Court if I don't get the justice in the commission. Yes. But High Court and uh, these commissions are different entities. Like and, what do you mean by different entities? Uh, when com coming to judiciary, uh, the mechanism the powers. Uh, I, if I go to High Court, High Court say that uh, RTI uh, got a different authority. That is the right authority to go back. No, no, no. no. Again. You can go to the High Court only after your case is decided by the commission. Right, right. Hmm. But if I go to the High Court, High Court say that, like, uh, 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 commission is the right authority. No, they won't say to, that. You can go back to commission again to make the decision. I don't know about your specific case, but uh, it doesn't happen. Once the once a decision is made by the commission, the decision is binding on everybody. If you're not satisfied, you can only challenge it as a writ petition in the High Court. Under okay. 226. Uh, courts, I mean, we have to talk about courts also. While uh, uh, So this act has is another uh, uh, long history. So in fact, Supreme Court and courts were the first ones to recognize that there is a, inherently our constitution had right to information even before it was made into a legislation in 2005. So right from 1970, even in the 1970s in the, the famous UP versus Rajanarayan case, the Supreme Court said every citizen has a right to information. It is embedded in Article 19 of right to freedom of speech and expression. So we got the legislation much later in 2005, but courts have always recognized that we had a right to information. But unfortunately, when it comes to them, courts have taken some decisions which are not in the best interests of RTI. So when it came to you know disclosing certain things, when it came to a lot of RTI petitions pending in the courts, in high courts and supreme courts, have been, uh, you will be surprised to know that uh, there was a there is a judgment given by the D then AP Information Commission on uh, the status of uh, Hyderabad Airport. Uh, what we call it is Rajiv Gandhi International Airport now because it's a PPP. The State Information Commission in two, back in 2008 said it's a public authority. That, you know, because uh, government of Andhra Pradesh then were, had a 26% stake, Airports Authority of India, I think, had 26% or whatever, it's a public authority. You'll not believe from 2008 till date that case is pending in the High Court of... Uh, so, now the High Court of Hyderabad. Uh, 2008. So, there are issues with courts also, not to say things are perfect, but courts have been championing this, but when it came to them, a lot of petitions, not just that one, if you go type RTA on the High Court's website, you'll realize how many cases are pending. There, this is not to say, this is not to, you know, there is, there, we should not get into despair, mode of despair. If you get into mode of despair, we'll be like that and we'll stop filing and it will die its own natural death. Government need not do any, any more changes. The act will die its own natural death. It will become one more defunct institution. So the rather what we should do now is not get too worried about what has been changed, but in fact file more and more, get more and more information. That's the only way to fight uh, whether the system or the commissions. So I have a general question uh, related to why the government is in sense of urgency to push through this. You know, we don't know. Is. That's what I'm saying. See, I'm I'm really surprised. Even till this till this day, I don't have an answer because. It has, it has no political ramifications whatsoever. I mean, it, it, it will not get them one single out. Even we can you know, go onto the road and ask the diehard BJP supporter if he would support that amendment. I'm sure he would have no opinion. He might not oppose it. But uh, I don't find anybody will support this. But I don't know the kind of urgency this government showed. We don't know if it's a bureaucratic misadventure where somebody advised the prime minister's office or somebody saying, you know, this is a good thing to do. We don't know. But I, I personally believe it's a wrong step. Uh, you know, they don't gain anything and the way it was done is far more dangerous. They should have at least sent it to the standing committee, there would have been deliberations, people would have spoken about it. If after all that it would have passed, that's okay. I mean, it's the part of the parliamentary procedure. 
but bulldozing it in just two days was was obviously you know against uh, everything that was about this act. Does that also going to bring down the quality of the information that we are going to see? No, that is a fear. See, that in that is a fear being expressed in certain sections that tomorrow if you control, you say you know I'll appoint you for X years, Y years, Z years, then obviously you are indirectly telling them how to behave. So if more and more, we have to wait and see if the statistics before and after change. So if X number of X percentage of bureaucrats were getting appointed and after this, you know, if it changes and more and more bureaucrats get appointed, not just bureaucrats, but people with political background or the bureaucratic background, it will obviously be a very regressive step. That is what is being anticipated. So unless government frames rules and says we do not know. In fact, one of the other demand that was being made during the amendment was, yes, you want to change the tenure, etc. put it in the act. Don't give power to yourself. So tomorrow, you might be power in power today, but tomorrow there might be another government who will do the same thing. You know, if you want, let's say you want to change the tenure to three years, do it, but put in the act. So that you have to come back to parliament if you have to change it. Now today, they need not come back to parliament. Any day they want to change the tenure, they can simply frame a rule, it's over. They need not come back to parliament because the tool making power is there with the government now. So one of the things that was spoken about, okay, you want to make an amendment, but put everything in the act. Don't take power for yourself. You know, into your hands and say, we'll do whatever we want. So instead of you know uh, doing these amendments, they could have actually brought too many uh, other issues into the ambit of RTI. That has also been silenced some no, or the other. Items. See, that's the irony of it. No, on the floor of the house, you know, if you have a minister saying we have done more to transparency than in, than any other government, and he speaks lies saying you know we made it 24/7. You can't do anything. I mean, somebody on the floor of the house, a minister is is blatantly lying. What can what more can you do? It's on the parliament record. I'm not even trying to make up things. It's there on the record. So, see, one good thing is this online portal has been extended now. That's one, if, I, if you ask me what, is, what has been one positive change in the last six years of this government, definitely the, uh, the RTA online portal which caters to all central government department has been expanded. So if you want to file the right to information application to any central government department today, you can do it online. That I can assure you, they have done it. You know, they have expanded and all that. But has the quality of responses, timeliness of responses changed in the last six years? I don't think so. Uh, in fact, it might have deteriorated, but not changed. I think if you have no question, my my uh, last comments would only be this: uh, Don't get disheartened and defeated. Uh, you know, it's uh, because in a democratic government, a, a government with a majority has every power, right and authority to pass laws. You know, that's that's how it happens. Uh, but what we can do is, like I said, don't get defeated and and then say this is the end of RTA. The moment we say it's the end of RTA, it will automatically be the end of RTA. Nobody needs to change anything. So there is no point to get defeated, uh, nothing to get disheartened about. Please file more and more, get more and more information because the act hasn't changed for us. It remains the same. We can still ask information. We have all the rights that were there in 2005. Nothing has changed for us. So if we can keep that in mind and say, let's, let's file more, you know, how, how does this government respond? If they're true to their word of being more transparent than previous government, they should give the information. There's no point hiding it. So I think the only way we can uh, counter all this is they're actually filing more and more, even on contentious issues, like you said. For example, you know, there are issues that are burning in this country, if it's economy, if it's GDP calculation, file on everything, get information. That's the only way to counter these changes. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, on a positive note that we are ending this uh, you know, talk, and I hope that we'll wait and watch for more things to come. And once again, we are going to trouble you then. No, no. Uh,